I want to begin with Romans chapter 12 in the New Testament, reading verses 4 and 5. Romans 12, 4 and 5. Paul writes to the church in Rome saying, Simply for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. Now if you go over to Ephesians 4, and he writes to the church in Ephesus, and he declares plainly among six other ones that there is one body in verse 4. Now, at that time, we all remember there was all kinds of pagan idolatrous worship. Then there were the Jews, a minority among all that Roman world. And now there are Christians even probably more of a minority, at least at about this time. And that's it, religiously. Most of the Romans who were the educated Romans would be considered the elite of Roman society had really given up any belief in any of the pagan gods. They basically kept some sort of lip service to the idols for political purposes and to have the masses continue to uphold them and whatever they did. But that's the way it was. It had been going on like that for a long time. It was a part of their fabric, religiously, morally, and every other way. It had made up their character. So for somebody to come along and declare there's one body, that must have raised some eyebrows. And assuredly, previous to that, when he declared there's one God, and then there is one Lord, and there is one Spirit, that was totally different from anything they had ever thought about. So here are these people in Rome who are Christians. Well, what does that tell me about them? Well, Romans 6 reminds us of what they did in believing and obeying to become a Christian. They understood the plan of salvation, and they from the heart had obeyed it, Romans 6, 17, and 18. And now to give emphasis to unity, there's one body. Then again, he writes to the church in Corinth, and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. Going back to the letter to the Ephesians, in Ephesians 2 and verse 16, the apostle says that he might reconcile both, speaking of Jew, and Gentile unto God then he says unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity which means hate thereby the hate that existed between Jew and Gentile then as you come over to the Colossian epistle Paul says in chapter 3 verse 15 let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which ye are also called in one body. And then as I said in chapter 4, he says there's one body. Seems to me that inspiration is placing a great deal of emphasis over our understanding of one body. And that there are many members making up the one body. When we think of an internal combustion engine, you have one engine, but yet look at all the parts of it. And each part has to be working properly and in concert with the other parts for the thing to run. 
So it's not something that is foreign to our understanding of one body in many parts. And yet, when it comes to the Lord's one body, we see that it's made up of many members. And that's the way it is. Now, body is just one of the ways the Holy Spirit refers to the realm of the saved. And that's what we're studying at this time. So we pose the question of what is the one body, and I've touched on that some already. But in that same Colossian epistle from which we read a moment ago, chapter 3 and verse 15, in the first chapter in verse number 18, it's very clear what the body is. Paul says to them, and he, speaking of Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church. That does not seem difficult. And yet I go back over to Matthew 16 and verse 18 in the Lord's ministry. And he promised to do something. He said, I will build my church. Singular. C-H-U-R-C-H. Singular. There's one worldwide church of Christ. Showing the relationship of the church that he promised to build to the one who built it. And vice versa. And thus Paul is consistent here in referring to the church being the body or the body, the church, but there's only one of them. I pause here and say all my life I've tried to figure out how somebody could say that all the denominations with their differing views, different names, Differing views on a number of things could say we're one and claim the same head and king as if he's telling this church one way to do something and this church another way to do something that doesn't fit in with what he told the first one and so on down the line to as many denominations as denominationalism will allow and I suppose that's as many as, as they can come up with. Because there's certainly many more denominations today than there were when I was growing up. If you look back at books written in the 50s and you see them talking about the number of denominations in America, they'll usually say 350. Well, that is not the way it is today. And yet when they go back to the New Testament, you can't find anything like that. And there is only one pure, complete source book they would say in historical research, primary source book, to understand anything correctly about Christianity, and it's going to be the Bible in general, but especially the New Testament. Whose New Testament? The New Testament of Christ. It's the last will and testament of Christ. I just simply cite the book of Hebrews to point that out. Christ's will, the authority of he who body he's the head, is said in the words of the New Testament. But we have it further explained to the Ephesians also. In Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23, that is the idea of one body. Where Paul said, and he gave him, Christ, to be head over all things to the church. And then he just simply says, which is his body. Well, I can read all these other passages that I did that says one body. Many members, but there's one body. And I can see here where he says that body is the church. And as I've already noticed, I can see plainly what Jesus promised to build. He promised to build one church. And I can go over to Acts chapter 2 where the church begins. And I just find one church beginning. And I find those people who receive the message of the gospel preached by the apostles, Peter's message is the one that's recorded by Luke. And those people, when they did what was necessary to be saved from their past sins, Acts 2, 37 and 38, the Lord added them to his church. But the Bible says that the church is the body, and it says there's one body. And there's only one church promised, which is his body, and there's only one church established, which is his body. And to it, he adds all the members. Well, where does that leave human religions? 
and the members of it. We've had a great move of apostasy in the church over the last number of years where people have tried to say, well, there's good religious people in all the churches. Well, I don't doubt that. But good religious people, I say good religious according to what? It's certainly not the teaching of the New Testament in its totality regarding the church that Jesus built. Why, you could get more simple than what I have read just a while ago. They have the same Bible we do. And by the way, even in the modern versions, I could deal with it right here and prove, even as I did this morning on, on the one baptism, I could take any of those versions and prove the truth of the new birth and prove the truth of the one body, that it is the church in Christ promised to build one church, and he did, Acts 2. And he added all those that he saved when they obeyed the gospel. They were born anew. They went through the new birth to the church. So when members of the church have been led astray to say, well, who are we to say that we're the only ones? Well, I didn't say originally we're the only ones. It didn't originate with me as a human being or any other human beings. What did we just read together, or at least what you heard me read from, if you didn't read it with me from your own Bible? What did we read? That's nothing that originated with man. If you believe the Bible to be truly the inspired, plenary, verbal inspired by the Holy Spirit, Word of God, the authoritative will of heaven for a man to understand what to do to be saved, and where Christ saves him, and what that place is, then how can I say that's just your view? It reads that way in your Bible if you'd never heard of me or anybody else. That's what it says. Now, if you think it says that just because I read it, well, then get away from me and read it and see if it says what it says. Many years ago, I was preaching a series of lessons in Arkansas on the design and end of miracles, which took us, I had a daily radio program, so I could carry that every day and hook them together. And I can't, the, the radio station was upstairs, and the, when you came down the stairs, they opened out on the street. And it was at 11.30, and so I would leave the office and go by and do the radio station, and when I I'd do the radio program, when I got through, I'd just drive back home for lunch. As I came out that day, across the street, there was a young man, and he was waving at me. I don't know how he knew me. Well, I acknowledged him. I knew who he was. Well, he came over and began to visit with me and let me know he'd been listening, and he was from a modern-day so-called miracle-working church. <laughs> So he was taking great exception to what I was saying, very nice about it. But out of that came a, a Bible study that we had for some time. So I simply said to him, now, now let's, let's start where when we both agree. And we both agree that the Bible is given to us by the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Yes, he did. That if we really both can find what the Holy Spirit said concerning how one's saved, and all connected with it, we'll, we'll be listening to the Holy Spirit, won't we? He said, yes. Well, we studied, a, I, I've forgotten now, a couple of weeks or whatever it was, and we, we were studying then uh, the, plan, the uh, cases of conversion because we wanted to listen to what the Holy Spirit said. Since he was big on that, I emphasized it. And we got over to... Paul's account in Acts 22 of his own salvation that Luke records. And we never read that yet. We never read it at all, at least together in this study. So when we sat down that day, I said, would you read this to me and read it out loud and tell me what it says? He read and he got all the way down to verse 16. Of course, it reads, Where Ananias said to Saul, Now why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Now he's reading this out loud to me. We've never read it together. But he's admitted this is the Spirit speaking to us. We both can agree on that because the Bible's inspired. And when he got through verse 16, reading it out loud, he says, That's just your interpretation. It was awful hard enough to laugh. It was just very, I'd said nothing. I had said not one thing. 
Now, does that tell you how entrenched people can get with a false concept? When I hadn't said a word, he was just reading the scriptures out loud. And he had been taught somewhere down the road that anybody that taught that baptism was necessary to salvation, that's just your interpretation. Well, we all interpret when we hear things read to us or said to us, or we read it. That's how we come to understanding. That's why when you're trying to learn to study the Bible, you have the rules of hermeneutics. People apply that mainly to the study of the Bible to learn the tools of hermeneutics, but you have the tools of, as a mechanic of the hermeneutics of, let's say, as I said earlier, internal combustion engine. They have the rules of regulation, that thing works. Well, it's true of so many things. So it is that when you're listening to me now, you're processing that, I hope. Now, if you're not listening to me, then uh, whatever you're processing, keep on. <laughs> Be like Brother Bales used to say on Monday when preachers having been out preaching. And he was telling us the first day of class, he said, I'm not going to wake you up to go sleep in my class. I don't know whether you got in 3 o'clock this morning for preaching or whatever happened, but I just assumed that, that you need the rest, and I'm not going to bother you. If you were sleeping in my class, that's your business. Of course, the thing he didn't say was you still have to pass the test and do everything in here. So I'm going to, you know, if you're sleeping, that's all right. You, you, you need the rest. But you're still responsible for the truth preached. So the thing it is, is that um, we have to be careful about ourselves. We have, to, we have to know the filters that we might put things through that change things from their origins. And the same thing true of one body. Look at all these different churches out here. Why? Why, you could read what I just read and that ought to say, God's not happy with that. The Lord only built one. Everybody Christ saves is put in one by himself. And you're baptized into Christ, which is into his church, which is only one body. I didn't come up with that. None of my brethren did. And the inspired word of God reads that way. And if I'm to have the proper concept of the church to which the Lord adds everybody he saves... When they're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, then I'm going to have to do that. How could we ever follow directions from anything if we don't get it past our own preconceived notions and viewpoints and likes and dislikes? Well, they would they would have to do, they, they would influence anything we do. Further with this, back to the book of Colossians 1 in verse 24. Paul wrote, for his body's sake, which is the church. That just adds to what we said earlier. There's no contradiction here. The body of Christ is the church, and there's one body, and that's what Christ promised to build when he promised to build one church. His body is the church, and he adds everybody to it. Well, can we recognize that church? Can we recognize that one body? Separate apart from all other religions, we can if we know the will of Christ concerning it. I've said this, but it's been a long time since I've said it. The people could find the Lord's church in the first century. Especially those who wanted to persecute it. They didn't have any trouble finding it. How did they do that? Because the church has marks that identify it and set it apart from every other religious institution. We, have pro we don't have a problem with that when it comes to our physical bodies, our fingerprints, other things about us. Set us, you as an individual, apart from every other person on this earth, and there's billions of us here. Now, one of the marks is that Christ is the head of his body. Why is that surprise? You have one head over your body. Meaning that that's where the brain's located and everything starts there and motivates and rules and ru controls everything else. And in chapter 8, or verse 18 of chapter 1 of Colossians, and he is the head of the body of the church. Well, then why do I come up here 
Or somebody else comes up here and say, well, the Pope's the head of the church. My Bible doesn't say that. Neither does, does your Bible. And by the way, neither, neither does the Catholic Bible say it. The Bible teaches plainly that Christ is the only head of the church. If you look back at the letter of the Ephesians in chapter 1 verse 22, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. If you look at the total context of that, you'll see because Christ is above and beyond all things, it's only natural that he's the head of the very body that is his spiritual body, the church. But in Ephesians 5.23, notice the analogy. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. That's given to help us understand, to help us grasp and know the relationship of Christ to the church. And also it helps us understand the nature of of husband-wife relationships. Now the question then could be raised, though I think a thinking person who will accept the Bible, the Bible only, could already figure it out. But the question arises, must we be members of the one body, the church, to be saved? Well, we're hearing a lot these days and have for some time, even in the Lord's, among the Lord's people, the church, that, well, there are good people everywhere in all the churches. Well, what does that mean? How do you define good? If I'm to define good as the New Testament or the Bible in general defines good, then I would say that's somebody that's in submission to God's will in all things. Because I can't conceive of somebody in submission to God's will in all things not being good. It's the only way I know to be good. In Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now think about that for a minute. Christ promised to build one church, Matthew 16, 18. He built it, Acts chapter 2. Those saved on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in response and obedience to the gospel, Acts 2, 37, 38, 41, and 42, he added to the church, verse 47. Now we spent all this time just a few minutes ago saying the body is the church. The church is the body. There's one head, Christ, over the body. It's natural. He built the church. That is the one body. Said over and over again, there's one body. Well, who's head of that church? Well, Christ is. But what's the church? It's his body. It's his spiritual body. So who is head of of the spiritual body, the spiritual head. Who is that? It's Christ. There's no room for anybody else. There's no one body out here with 400 heads, and there's no bodies, bodies out there with one head, whether it's two bodies or 15 or 500. One body to one head, one head to one body. That body is the church, spiritually speaking, and the one head is Jesus Christ. That's one of the ways that you find and identify the church. Somebody tells me, well, so-and-so is the head of the church of which I'm a member. Not Christ, but somebody else. Or a group of people, let's say, are head of. I don't mind telling them, well, then you're not a member of the church that you read of the New Testament. Some way or the other, we in the church, in trying to evangelize the world and dealing mostly, at least to a great extent, with denominational people, have got to get them back to understanding the New Testament definition of the church. Because they're going to think in denominational terms. That's why they say, well, you folks think you're the only ones going to heaven. They're saying that from the standpoint, there's ever however many denominations there are. And why do you think your denomination is the only one going to heaven. Well, if the brethren have apostatized the point where they think that the church of which they're a member is a denomination, they're not going to heaven. They've apostatized. They've left the faith. 
But when you read the New Testament, we've got to say something like, well, what does the New Testament teach? Because there's no appreciation for New Testament authority. Today, always has been that way among a lot of people, but years ago, there were a lot more people that respected authority in general and New Testament authority more than others. Let me just put it this way. Christianity is the religion of biblical authority. Where there is no biblical authority, no authority of Christ, there are no Christians. In Ephesians 5.25 again, you see that Christ gave himself for the church. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Well, that's a challenge for all of us husbands concerning the proper love we have for our wives. Nevertheless, that's what the Holy Spirit said. And yet he was speaking, as he'll say at the end of that chapter, primarily of the church. That was his point. And then you read in Acts 20 and 28, Luke recording it, but Paul originally saying it to the shepherds of the church at Ephesus. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Well, there's one church. How do I know that? There's one body. What does that mean? It means since the church is the body and there's one body, there's one church. And that's all he promised to build. That's all he established in Acts 2. And you can't find any more than that. Yeah, but what is it? What is it? When I come over to Revelation and I've got seven churches of Asia. Well, that's only getting the idea of geographic locations. There's no larger or smaller organized entity of the one body of Christ, the church, except on a local level. In each congregation, when fully and scripturally organized, there's elders and deacons and teachers and preachers and members. It's not organized on a worldwide basis. There is no headquarters of the church on earth, whether it's Nashville, Tennessee, or Timbuktu. The headquarters of the church is where the king sets ruling. And Peter declared him be sitting and ruling in heaven at the right hand of God, the very first recorded gospel sermon in Acts 2 when the church was established. But how do I know what he wants? He's in heaven because he's given us his last will and testament. person dies today, you can't go ask him, what do you want done? with what you've left behind. And he will leave all of it behind. Well, if he didn't make a will, you don't know. But if he made a will, and you respect that will, then you're going to go to that will to find out what he wants done with what he left behind. And if you respect him, you'll abide by the authority of his words in that will that manifested his ideas and thoughts as to what he wants done what he left behind. Well, the Lord left a will. It's called the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. And if I want to know, since Christ is in heaven, ruling at the right hand of God, what he wants me to do to be saved, or where he saves me, or what the body is, I'm going to have to read that will. And that's what we've been doing this afternoon. If you say, well, I'll go to the Methodist discipline. Well, you'll learn how to be a Methodist there. That's why they got a Methodist discipline. Well, we'll go to um, a Baptist manual. Well, you'll learn how to be a Baptist there. Or you go to certain confessions of faith, Westminster Confession of Faith. You'll learn how to be whatever those churches are that, that appeal to that, Presbyterian or otherwise. Why is a Presbyterian church called a Presbyterian church? Well, they just selected the fact they had presbyters and they named it after them. Well, presbyters... They're not the only thing shepherds are called. They're called also pastors. <laughs> that reminds me of something. Somebody was emphasizing the other day when I was watching this sermon. <laughs> he said shepherds, emphasizing the importance of the work of shepherds, and it is important what they were saying is true. That shepherds aren't, there, aren't out there driving the sheep. The scriptures present shepherd as leading the sheep. He said the fellow was over in 
the Holy Land as we call it, and said he was watching this guy out there and said he was chasing those sheep. And said he got a, close to him after a little while and he said, I thought a shepherd led the, che- the sheep, not chased them. He said, but I'm a butcher. Well, <laughs> and they tell you a lot. They tell you a whole lot. The point is, we've got to go to the scriptures to determine the truth of the matter. Whether it's shepherds, or whether it's the church, and what the church is, and it's identifying marks and the importance of it. Now, if I stop right here and say, do you think the New Testament says the church, the body of Christ, is important? How could you read these things believing this to be the infallible word of God, final revelation and complete revelation of God to man, and say, well, I still think you can go to whatever church you want to and just be sincere and you're all right. You don't learn that from the scriptures. You can't find that idea in the scriptures. It's not there. In Ephesians 2.16, the scripture says again that he might reconcile both, Jew and Gentile, unto God in one body. How are men truly going to be reconciled to God? They need reconciliation to God. They've separated themselves from God by the sins they committed against against Him. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. How are we going to be reconciled to God? Well, we studied this morning about the new birth. I won't rehash that, how that happens. And nobody's a Christian that is not born again. But now... We're born into the kingdom. But lo and behold, the kingdom is the church. In promising to build that one church in Matthew 16, he used kingdom and church interchangeably to talk about the same thing he was going to build. And now we've learned already, if we will receive with meekness the engrafted word, that the body is the church and the church is the body. And there's one head, and that's Christ, over the church. And there are members in particular. And that he reconciles all people to God in that church. And church is not important. Well, the church is, is, is worthless. How do you get reconciled to God? And no wonder Christ added the saved to the church. They had their past sins remitted, Acts 2, verse 38. And the Lord put them in the church. Because that's where you're reconciled to God. Sounds like to me, church is pretty important. But nominationalism, I can't think of the thing... The devil would rather sell. Isn't that important? You talk to any denominational person, and the church basically is just a social instrument that you pick because it suits you. And you'll hear these people like Billy, the late Billy Graham and others of his stripe, who will say, now now get saved and just pick a good Bible-believing church. You never find that in the Bible. Anybody told to do that. It's just not there. Just not there. So in Acts 2, 47, the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Is that hard to understand? Well, since the church is the body and Christ is the Savior of the body, then how can men be saved without being members of the church where all men are reconciled to God? How can we, seeing that it's purchased, that is the church, by the blood of Christ, How can people be saved and not be members of the blood-bought institution, the church? It doesn't take a whole lot of identifying marks to see that denominationalism is not in harmony with the teaching of God's good word when it comes to the one body, the one church, the one kingdom. strange to me that people can see there's one king and they don't expect him to be over more than one kingdom. But they can't see that the kingdom is the body and the body is the church. Just different ways to get over to us the importance of and what that realm of the saved is like. So, the church, one more thing and we'll close. The church is spoken of as God's family, God's household. Paul said to Timothy, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That is, he said that to the Ephesians in Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 15. But now to Timothy 
in 1 Timothy 3.15, he said, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Let's see. Let's think a little bit. House of God, family of God, which is the church of the living God, body of Christ, which is the church. There's one body, and there's one church, there's one family of God. God's our heavenly Father. He begets children through the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. And then people are born of water and the spirit into the kingdom of God. Does God have children outside of his family? When people say that he has children, all these different families, what are they by implication charging God with? And they don't think that's blasphemy? The family of God is the one church Jesus died to purchase, Acts 20 and 28. And that one church is his body, and it's the same as his family. There's one head over the family and there's one head over the church. We're not trying to uphold some sort of bunch of traditions and things that men come up with. We're simply saying whether you ever heard of any man or not and you had your Bible and you're reading it, you can see these things. The truth of the matter is you have to have help to misunderstanding. And most people are so influenced. It's such a part of the fabric of What's called Christianity, it's not Christianity, denominationalism, in America, the people just can't see it. I want to close on this. I heard this from the late Roy Deaver when he was in class at Fried Hardeman, and that goes back a long time ago. And there was this one particular student in class who kept saying whatever Brother Hardeman was trying to emphasize there, he said, I just can't see that. I just can't see that. I just can't see that, Brother Hart. There was a girl in the class, Brother Dee even called her name, who had been blind since birth. And it was a beautiful, clear day. He just turned to this girl, called her name, said, would you go to the window and tell me, the sun, is it shining? Is it bright? And she said, Brother Hartman, you know I can't see. I can't see that. But, you know, just because she couldn't see it didn't mean it wasn't there. And you can prove something to be the case, but that doesn't mean I proved it to you. Because there's all sorts of things can be in your mind that's stopping all that. You're blind, leaders of the blind. What do you Christ mean by that? You don't have the capacity to understand what I'm teaching you? No. You've got other things up there far more important influencing you that you're hanging on to to where you don't want to see it. So when you have apostasy as it's been in the church over the last number of years, why is that the case? Because they've come to believe things and they love it. They love it more than they love the truth. And that brings us back then to Paul's own statement in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. The Spirit is the speaker. He speaks what? Words. He speaks expressly. He speaks plain words. And what does he speak? That some shall depart from the faith. You can't leave what you weren't in. So these are Christians. Some shall depart from the faith. How did they do it? Giving heed. They paid attention to doctrines of demons. Well, that didn't mean a demon left... uh, the spiritual world that came down and took over and taught them. You got to realize that's meaning Satan's agents taught them false doctrine. Now think of what we studied in John, 1 John, about the lie. And then think about Eve, who heard God's will concerning the forbidden fruit, could quote it back to the serpent, but what'd she do? She let her appetites, her desires of the flesh cause her to believe the lie and was deceived of Satan and obeyed it and sinned. And that's where we are. Now, if we're going to keep ourselves pure and undefiled and faithful and walking the straight and narrow way, we've got to understand that about ourselves first. 
take heed unto yourself. Because uh, we can erect idols in our lives. It may be a wife or a husband or children or mom and daddy or some something in this world. Something you like a whole lot. And then whenever it comes up against the teaching of the Bible, it interferes with that great love and loyalty we have to it. Now, what are we going to do? To Abraham take thy son, the son whom thou lovest, and offer him a burnt offering. What are you going to do, Abraham? Well, what did he do? And he's the father of the faithful, the epitome of faithful obedience. He said about to obey God without any questions. You know, the scripture says that he got up early in the morning and started toward where God said do it. I think I'd like to sleep late that morning. But to obey his God... His faith caused him to get up early in the morning and head straight for the mountain of Moriah and there to offer his son Isaac. And yet he knew that God had to keep Isaac alive because all these promises God made to him depended on being done through Isaac. But we know from Hebrews he thought, well, God can raise him up from the ashes of the sacrifice. Nevertheless, he knew that his faith was to obey God. Let us understand the one body let us realize it's taught in the Bible and let us realize who we are as members of the body of Christ and that only those saved by Christ are in that one body and we dare not depart from it. Thus, we didn't know about it. We didn't know the identifying marks of it and we need to be sure that we are faithful in it. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, you must believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your past sins. If you'll do that, you'll wise from the watery grave of baptism to walk in the newness of life, added to the church by the Lord, a member of that one body with Christ as head, to live your life in concert with the teachings of the New Testament concerning Christian living. As a child of God, have you wandered from any aspect of it? If so, repentance is called for on your part and a confession of sins before God and prayer to Him for forgiveness. If you're subject then to the Lord's invitation, again, we humbly invite you to respond while together we stand and sing.